Welcome to Hour 1 of the WGN Radio Theater, program 466 in the series. It's April 25th, and we'll be here till 3 o'clock in the morning, playing five hours of classic radio shows. In fact, we will have seven classic radio shows for you. Did you know that, Lisa? Yeah, we have a couple little extra treats this evening. Yes, we do. That is voice is from the uh, vivacious Lisa Wolf right there. How are you, Lisa? I'm great. How are you feeling? I'm Everything doing good? well. Yeah, everything's good. We're good. Glad you're healthy. We hope everybody out there is staying healthy as well. That's right. We're here to entertain you. And uh, thanks for tuning us in. We have Dragnet to start things off. We will then listen to Burns and Allen, Gunsmoke, The Strange Doctor Weird, Suspense, the Damon Runyon Theater, and a five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar adventure called The Silver Blue Matter. So uh, seven classic radio shows coming your way. Not bad, huh, Lisa? We got a full... Squeezing it all in to (laughs) five hours. We're trying to keep everybody busy and happy and enjoying our show this evening. That's right. Let's uh, start things off with Dragnet right after this break. Welcome back to the WGN Radio Theater. In this hour, we're going to tune into Dragnet starring Jack Webb. But I do want to remind you that we have five classic radio shows waiting for you to digitally download. They're absolutely free. They're for all of our listeners as a thank you for listening to the show. Go to 100radioshows.com. There are five shows, and they are... They are Jack Benny, yes. Tim McGee and Molly, Gunsmoke, Suspense, and Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Five great shows, yes. completely free. If you'd like any additional shows, you can purchase them, although there's no obligation to do that. And if you decide to purchase any shows, we have a very special code for you. The code is RADIO. You can put that in after you uh, choose your items in your shopping cart and save 70% off the regular price. Right. Promo code RADIO at checkout. Save 70%. And there are hundreds and hundreds of radio shows at this website for purchase. But whether you want to buy any or not, go and get your five free shows. Log on to 100radioshows.com. All right, Lisa, it's time for probably the best police procedural show ever on radio or TV, Dragnet. Came to radio in 1949, lasted nine seasons until 1957. These were true crime stories of closed cases from the Los Angeles Police Department. Jack Webb starred as Sergeant Joe Friday, and each case was detailed from start to finish. Friday narrated the action. And these shows were filled, absolutely filled with sound effects. They had five sound effects experts working on this series. Now, other shows had, you know, one or two sound effects, men or women. This show, five. And uh, here's something that you may not know. Just the facts, ma'am, was never uttered. By Jack Webb. It's one of those things. It's like in the lexicon, right? I know. You hear Dragnet and you think, just the facts, Facts, ma'am. But no such. He never said it. Um, Radio's best supporting players on Dragnet, Frank Lovejoy, Paul Fries, Parley Bear, Harry Bartell, Peggy Weber, William Conrad. There were movies of Dragnet and then 16 seasons on television, black and white and also color. Do you remember watching Dragnet I do. as a child? Oh, yeah. I, I remember watching it. the color episodes. I, exactly. Because the, bla- the black and white had been already long gone. But, yeah, Dragnet was great on uh, on radio and TV. Yeah. And I think it's the best when it's uh, Dragnet in a theater of your mind because your theater of the mind is so powerful. We have a Dragnet. Dragnet episode for you now, September 15th, 1953. This is called The Big Cab. Here's Jack Webb in Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A hold-up man has robbed the owner of a neighborhood grocery store. The victim has been beaten unmercifully with a sawed-off shotgun. The assailant has escaped into the city without a trace. Your job? Find him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step-by-step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, 
From crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, February 18th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Thad Brown. My name's Friday. The office had called me at 3.46 a.m., and by the time I got dressed and out in front of my apartment, it was 3.59 a.m. Frank was there waiting to pick me up. What's the best way to get there? Down the freeway, I guess, and cut over on the Liso, huh? All right. Who called you, the hospital or the office? The office said that Bailey had regained consciousness. We might be able to talk to him now. The rain's going to slow us down. Well, I better use the light and siren, Frank. We may not have much time. Huh? The way the skipper put it to me on the phone. Yeah? They still don't know if Bailey's going to live. Raymond Bailey was 62 years old. He owned and operated a small neighborhood grocery store on the corner of Whitman and Beacon Streets. Two days before, on Monday night, a man had entered the store and at the point of a sawed-off shotgun had robbed Bailey. After emptying the cash register and the safe, he'd slugged the elderly man with the barrel of the gun and he'd fled. Bailey had been rushed to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital and then transferred to the county hospital for treatment. For the past two days, he'd been under a heavy sedative and he'd been in a coma. He was suffering from a skull fracture, cuts and bruises. His condition was listed as critical, and we'd left word to be called the minute he regained consciousness. 4.26 a.m., we got to the hospital, we went up to the fourth floor. We met and talked with the doctor who'd been taking care of Bailey. He told us that the patient had just been given another shot to ease the pain, and that he'd probably drop off to sleep. We went into the hospital room and walked over to the side of the bed. It was a few minutes before the old man started to talk. I'll tell you what I remember. All seemed kind of far away like I read about it in a book. Uh, not, not like it really happened to me. All right, sir, if you just tell it in your own words, if you can. What time is it? It's quarter to five, Mr. Bailey. Who's that? I'm Frank Smith. Uh, you a policeman, too? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, quarter to five, huh? That day or night? It's in the morning, sir. Uh-huh. I sure been out. If you'd tell us what happened, sir. How many of you are there in here? With just the two of us. Yeah. The way they got in my head, all bandies can't see. Say, officers. Yes, sir. Doctor said this is Wednesday. Is that true? Yes, sir, that's right. Wednesday the 18th. I can't figure where the time's gone. It can't be Wednesday. Why do you have to agree with him? Why don't you tell me for true? Well, sir, you've been asleep for a couple of days. Really? Yes, sir. Been pretty sick, huh? That's what they tell us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Seems like every time I turn around and give me another shot. Takes the pain away, but makes everything seem so far away, like nothing was really happening to me. Yes, sir, we understand. Think you could go on with the story? Uh, oh, yeah. Hey, th this fellow came in Monday night. It was raining. wasn't much business. I was figuring on closing when he came in. Took one of the carts and started to pick up stuff off the counter. Yes, sir. Well, the fellow picked up a lot of stuff. Had a shopping bag with him, hung it on the cart. I figured that I'd have to check the bag when he got the check stand. We had a lot of shoplifting lately. I see. Well... After he looked store over, he came up to check stand. I checked out the stuff he had. Came to over five dollars. Oh, picked out all kinds of things. Most of them imported. I see. These were all groceries, were they? Yes. I had the stuff, and it come to a little over five dollars. Oh, I got exactly how much. Eh, a little over five dollars. All right, sir. After I got everything all told up, I asked him if I could put it in a shopping bag for him. I didn't want to come right out and ask to see in it. After all, he might have just moved in the neighborhood, and I haven't got that many regulars that I can insult him. Yes, sir. That's when he pulled the gun. Pulled it right out of the shopping bag. Now, you saw that it was a shotgun, did you? Yes, sir. Barrel was short. I guess it had been sawed off. Mm -hmm. He pointed at me and told me to give him the money in the cash register. All right, sir. And then he told me to lay down on the floor and stay there for five minutes and not to move. Mm -hmm. I was going to do it. I wasn't going to give him any trouble. Money doesn't mean that much to me. You you get to be my age, 62, and it's more important than you're alive than how much money you got. Yes, sir. A lot more important. Yes, sir. Well, I just going to do like he said when Mrs. Colton came into the store. She's one of my regular customers, you know. I see. She saw the fellow with the gun, and she let out a scream. I tried to tell her to keep quiet, but... Before I could say much of anything, the fellow turned around and hit me with a gun. Oh, I say, 
hit me just about as hard as he could. I kind of remember the sirens coming, but after that, it's kind of hazy, like it didn't really happen to me, like uh, like I read about it. I see, sir. Now, can you tell us what the man looked like? Yeah, I guess I can. Uh, a bit before I do, though. Yes, sir. Uh, would you tell me what time it really is? Well, right now, it's 4.50, Mr. Bailey, 4.50 a.m. Wednesday morning? Yes, sir, that's right. I don't think it's very nice you fellas play a joke like this on old man. Seems like you could be honest. If I had my watch, I could tell myself. Well, we're telling you the truth about the time, Mr. Bailey. It's 4.50. Uh, all right, then you have your little joke, but I don't think it's funny at all. Now, sir, can you tell us how old the man was? About 24, 26. I see. How tall was he? Tall as me. I can remember because I could look right over straight at him. That'd make him five and eight. Yeah, right about that. Was he heavy or slight? I couldn't tell too well. He had a big overcoat on. How about his coloring, his complexion? Oh, he's dark-complected, had dark eyes. Do you remember what the color of his hair was? Well, I, I could just see it, the temples. It uh, it was black. Yeah. He had this hat on, the hat pulled down. Uh-huh. Was he clean-shaven? Uh, yeah, yes, he was. We're sorry to have to ask you all these questions, but we have to get to the bottom of this. Did he have any marks or scars? Yes, yes, sir. He had a little mole on the side of his nose, just a small little one. On which side of his nose would you remember? Well, when he was facing me, it was on the left, so that'd be on his right. Yeah, that, that's right, on the right side. I hope we're not tiring you too much, but was there anything different about the way he talked, an accent, something like that? No. Say, uh, how about the things he picked up? You get any fingerprints from him? No, sir. He must have taken all the groceries with him. Would you know the man if you saw him again, Mr. Bailey? Uh, you just bet I would. I'd remember that face till my dying day. I won't ever forget it. Think you've ever seen this man before? No, sir, never did. Would you know if he drove a car? Well, I, I don't think so. He was so wet when he come in. He must have walked a ways. And like I said, his shoulders are just soaking wet. Yes, sir. We'd like to have you look at some pictures when you feel a little better, Mr. Bailey. Uh, you just bring them on. You got a picture of that young hoodlum, I'll know it. All right, sir. We're going to have to come back and see you. You ought to try to get some sleep now. We appreciate your cooperation here. Well, I suppose I should. The last couple of minutes, you fellas been getting a little further away from me. Seems like none of this is happening to me, just like I'm dreaming it. Well, we'll be back to see you, sir. Is there anything you need? No, sir. Not a thing. All right, fine. Thanks very much, and you get some rest now. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try. Hey, hey, one thing you could do for me. What's that, sir? Would you ask the nurse to come by? I think the joke is funny, but you fellas carried it on too far. I'd like to know what time it really is. All right, Mr. Bailey. We'll send her in. Thank you. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye. Pardon me, nurse. Uh, yes? What if you check Mr. Bailey in there? He'd like to know what time it is. Well, he's been asking the same question the last two days. He won't seem to believe any of us. Mm -hmm. But you know where you can find Dr. Cardell? Yes, sir, just down the hall, two doors past the turn. Thank you very much. I'd sure like to find out when he'd be able to look at those mug shots. Yeah, he's got a good description. It'll make it easier. Yeah. Well, I guess this is it. Two doors past the turn. Yeah. Come in. Sorry to bother you again, Doctor. That's all right. What can I do for you? We were wondering when it would be possible for Mr. Bailey to look at some pictures for us. I mean, when he's well enough. Well, with the way he's been reacting to treatment, he'll live. Yes, sir. But you saw the bandage. Yes, sir. He's totally blind. Five ten a.m., we got to the city hall. We got out a supplementary broadcast and an APB carrying the description of the suspect. We asked the stats office to make a run for us on the information the victim of the holdup had given us. They said they'd be able to give us a list of possibles by 10.30 that morning. We checked through the oddity file to see if there might be something in the records on the small mole on the suspect's nose. There were several cards turned over to us, but none of them matched the rest of the description that we had. 6.30 a.m., we went across the street, we had breakfast, and then we came back to the office and put in a call to the hospital to check on Bailey. The doctor told us that he was sleeping comfortably and he appeared to be past the critical point. For the next hour, Frank and I checked through the mug books to see if there were any recent parolees who matched the description that we had. We came up with nothing that would help us in getting an identification of the suspect. The woman customer of the store mentioned by Bailey in his report of the crime had been questioned thoroughly, but she was unable to give us any additional information on the holdup man. 
She was unable to give us a concrete description of the thief. She'd been shown the mug book.